This is Dog Storian. Stories about dogs. And their people. And related species. Like cats. And this is me, Justina. And this is me, Brian. Oh. In today's episode, there aren't going to be any dogs. You are aware this is Dog Storian. Yes. Did, did we change the name? Or? Yes, I am fully aware, and I confirm this is not an episode about dogs. We already know everything about them. Time to move on. Really? Okay, bad joke. <laughs> 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 the point is that we were having a conversation with our friend Anurag, and at that time he was back at his home country, India, mm-hmm. and he told us a few memorable stories about jackals. I get it. So we're not talking about dogs, we're talking about relatives. Yeah, you can put it that way. Wasn't he talking about that that uh, book of fables, what was it called? Pa- pa- Panch Tantra? I'm going to butcher it. Yeah, Panch Tantra. That's basically the Indian version of Aesop's fables. Aesop's fables. Yeah. I read that. Yeah. Or it was read to me. Yeah, I don't remember the jackal's feature there. I don't think so. Well, let's hear In India, mostly what I have observed with my readings is that every animal has been assigned a certain characteristic in India. A jackal or a fox is a cunning animal. So jackals are mostly, one, they are scared animals. So they are very cunning and they are like very backhanded kind of people. So they can't be trusted. And uh, a lot of our stories, they compare human nature to these animals. So if someone is a cunning person or a backhanded person or who can't be trusted, then he's compared to a jackal or a fox. Or such stories are basically moral stories to teach people not to be like them. The jackals are always perceived to be uh, that kind of animal who will always trick you for their own benefit. You know, there's a word in Hindi or Sanskrit called dhurt. So they basically will do anything to make their way and once their job is done once they are successful in whatever they whatever the endeavor was they just Mm -hmm. kick you in in your butt and leave you alone basically so that's the nature of the jackal mostly so even the basic premise of the first lesson the two ministers were jackals they also did the same thing so they wanted to become a loyal and a favorite to the king so they made him friends with the this bull and then when they saw that, okay, now the bull is a danger for us, so they just made, made them fight and uh, and the lion killed the bull at the end. Yeah, so that's how jackals are mostly. Now the thing is that uh, cities in India, I mean, I remember seeing them uh, once or twice in my native, which is uh, not as developed as a Mumbai or a, or a Pune where I live now. I have seen them as a child a couple of times so I was just in the car with my father and we were just coming from somewhere and just it crossed us that didn't used to be a big deal even in the villages I remember uh, there are stories that my mom used to tell me or my grandmother or grandfather used to tell me that in their villages jackals would often come and grab their babies and take them to the jungle and kill them because jungles and the villages were extremely close and jackals are not like lions so they were prominent this this is around 30 40 years back so the father often goes to the farm and stays up all night guarding his farm against other kind of animals if the door is open or the mother is asleep or she's alone or she's inside because uh, villages in india have these open courtyards in which there are multiple rooms and each room has one family for example one father mother and child lives in one room and there are like 40 50 rooms like that in one courtyard the ladies are often inside talking to each other or making food together, something like that, and the gents are somewhere else. So it is possible in that kind of environment, and it's pretty open. So uh, And the houses were not as strong as now. They were mostly mud houses or very basic ones. It is possible that the doors were open. Jackals are famed, at least where I come from, to be stealing some babies. Now, I think because there's too much urbanization, jungle is less. I mean, the forest area is comparatively less now. So it is hard to see that happen. Wow. That was quite an image of the, the uh, jackal stealing a baby. Mm-hmm. Indeed. I, but I guess we're safe here, right? In Europe? I guess. You guess. <laughs> Let's say they may be closer than you'd expect. Oh, no. <laughs> That's a good thing I don't have any babies. Well, our next guest, Nathan Rank. We'll explain it better than we can. Excellent.
Well, how to introduce myself? I'm a PhD student at Harvard University and the Fondazione Edmund Mac in Italy. I actually just graduated and defended my PhD last week. I work primarily on the spatial memory, basically how animals live in a constrained space, which we call a home range, and what are the biological determinants that make home range useful to animals. If you look at most animals, they live in a very small area compared to their movement capacity. My study animal is roe deer primarily, and roe deer would live all their life in about a square kilometer. Why is that? They can cross this square kilometer in just a few minutes. And so I, I was looking into what are the benefits of knowing a place for their survival. My main point was to design experiments in the field to understand how they use memory and why memory is advantageous for their survival. So that's the main project I've been doing throughout my PhD. But I also have, have had a very uh, invasive uh, side project on golden jackals. Invasive because it took a lot of time of my PhD. Which is a little bit funny because they are, I think, called an invasive species. Yeah, we can come back to that. It's a wrong term for, for jackals. How did I get involved in jackals? It all started, I think it was uh, 2013. I'm a very keen mammal watcher. That means I travel Europe and sometimes the world to see animals, and especially mammals. You know, there is a big birding community. Everybody knows about birders, those people in the wetlands with spotting scopes. There is also a side community, which is much less famous. It's the mammal watching community. So I'm just curious, is there a thread that connects your childhood fascination with animals to the work you ended up doing? Well, I've been passionate about animals forever. I think I'm lucky because I came to ecology as a scientific discipline, but I, I am a naturalist way before being an ecologist. I spent my childhood looking at birds, and when I was 14, I was trying to see wolves in the Alps and hiding in the mountains to see them. So for me, it was a natural link. But yeah, it's passion for wanting to see animals. For me, that's the driving thing. Some of my colleagues, I've never seen their study animals. That's something I can't, I can't possibly understand. I have to see, I have to share, I have to, I have to sleep where they sleep. <laughs> I don't know. I, I gotta, you know, it's, it's a matter of, uh, of trying to see the world through their perspective. One species I had not seen yet in Europe was golden jackals. I knew about them. I knew they were expanding in Eastern Europe and I really wanted to get the best information from some of my colleagues on where to go and watch those uh, exotic, because it sounds exotic. If you think about jackals, it's exotic for Europeans. It shouldn't be, but it is. That's how it sounds. So I mailed one of my colleagues at the time, Miha Krofel, who's working on large carnivals in Slovenia. And uh, I really asked Miha, you know, can you give me any tips? Where, where can I go and, and watch uh, jackals? Miha not only gave me good tips, he also sent me a paper, a piece of, uh, of analysis that they had done on uh, habitat selection and jackals in Eastern Europe. And that was right when I finished my master's degree. At that point, I had done quite a lot of modeling on species distribution. My first response to Miha was, maybe we could use some of the models I've done for my master's and, and try to see if we can... Uh, take what your analysis to a second level and look in particular at the interaction with wolves and, and a lot more things on this, on, you know, on, on this direction. Coming back from a holiday, I stopped on the side of a highway pretty much. Miha and I met, we discussed a project and that's how we started. After that, I've been working on jackals since then. So where do the jackals come from? Why do they appear to be exotic in Europe? They feel exotic because if you talk about jackals to people, they'll tell you Africa. They'll tell you that's savanna, that's lions, you know, elephants and giraffes and, and whatnot. And so it's exotic because in the traditional knowledge, it's, a, it's an African animal. What's crazy is that jackals are in Europe for at least six, 6,000 years, probably. It shouldn't feel exotic because they have been on this continent, you know, for a very long time. But nevertheless, they are so unknown to the general public. And also because they have been largely restricted to Eastern Europe, they did not really enter the traditional knowledge in Western cultures. So they have been mostly part of the, of the cultural aspects in Greece, in Bulgaria, where they, where they have been present for the longest time period. For us in, you know, in France or in Germany or in Switzerland, that sounds, that sounds not a European animal. True. I remember how surprised I was to read that they came to Estonia and Latvia. Yeah which are neighbors of my home country, Lithuania. Yeah, I imagine. The only knowledge I had about jackals when growing up was that there's an Egyptian god who has 
I had over Jackal. Mm -hmm. Anubis. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Anubis. You know, the figure of Anubis then influenced a lot of, uh, of you know, more recent cultures and, and on the role of jackals. But, but, but in general, it's very surprising for an animal of that size, the amount of misconceptions, the lack of knowledge, and also somehow the, the, you know, the general silence surrounding its presence in traditional culture. It's very surprising for an animal of this size, you know, especially in, in a continent where most mammals aren't, you know, megafauna. It's in the category of large mammals. It's very surprising. Exactly. And I also read that there are more jackals than wolves. Jackal density is much higher, but uh, in Europe, I think, we, we're much lower in terms of, of wolf population. I would say we're about 30,000, something like this. But again, uh, drastically different estimates whether you include the European side of Russia or not. For what concerns jackals, we estimate that there are about 100,000 in Europe now. So is there only one type of jackal or more? And, and which one resides in Europe? There is only one species of jackal in Eurasia. It's the golden jackal, whose distribution starts in Southeast Asia, all throughout Southern Asia, Middle East, Turkey, Israel, and now Southeastern Europe, and a large portion of Eastern Europe. The taxonomy of jackals in Africa is a lot more complicated and is still a subject of debate. We do think that golden jackals are only an Eurasian animal. And previously, it was thought that golden jackals would extend their distribution till uh, Eastern Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa in general. But now the revised text basically suggests that probably another species. Again, that's very, that's very new and, and still up for debate. Could you maybe tell a little bit about the canid family itself and what the jackal's place in it is? It's quite complicated because the canid family is being frequently uh, revised. There is a very hot topic of what's a red wolf, or what's an eastern gray wolf. Now, in the old continent, we got these interesting topics of what are jackals. For what concerns the golden jackal, I wouldn't know really how to say how it's placed in the canid family. But what I know is that it hybridizes with dogs, potentially with wolves. What do you mean by hybridizes? So they can mate with dogs. So mm -hmm. uh, vagrant dogs that go off their ho the houses and run free in the, in the wild have a chance to hybridize with jackals. And those hybrids are, the, are themselves fertile. Mm -hmm. So we have already second and third generation hybrids, dog, uh, jackal, especially it's been shown in Croatia. Mm -hmm. We have a few hybrids that have been found. And there is a suggestion that they may also hybridize with wolves. And there is one genetic sample in Bulgaria that looks like a hybrid between golden jackal and gray wolf. So is this common to hybridize or is that more a product of human activity? Many canids, ecologists and experts uh, refer to canids as the canid soup uh, <laughs> because hybridization is quite prevalent. Coyote and gray wolf in America, now golden jackal and gray wolf, very likely. Wolf and dog, it's a very big conservation concern. It's known that canid species hybridize, and I think it's far more common in canids than it is in felids, for example. To some extent, hybridization is mediated by people, especially when it comes to wolf, dog, or jackal dog hybridization. The quantity of dogs that are vagrant, the modification of the landscape, which may increase the zones of contact between dogs and the wild canids, definitely accentuate and may promote hybridization. Mm -hmm. To some degree, it's a natural phenomenon. There are plenty of papers and research articles that show that hybridization is a, definitely a driving process for the origin of species and speciation in general. But people, and either directly through their pets in the case of dogs or through habitat modification, may change patterns of hybridization in nature. I read about Sulimov dogs. Mm -hmm. You heard about them, I presume, right? Of course, yeah. What struck me as very curious was the argument the scientist Sulimov gave for why he wanted to breed dog and jackal hybrids. So he had a hypothesis that jackals have a superior sense of smell in comparison to dogs. Do you think this claim is a bit too bold, or does jackal really stand out in the canid family? Well, canids have, uh, without a doubt, a very strong sense of smell. Now, 
whether jackals have a superior sense of smell than dogs, I would say what which dog breed are we talking about, first of all. Whether they have a stronger sense, sense of smell of that wolf, I think it's a bold claim. Because, first of all, understanding sensory perception in wild animals is something incredibly complex. And in fact, that's something I, I've been working on my thesis. You know, animals can get... Uh, information through their memory or through perception. Those are two streams of information that somehow our brain has to constantly integrate. I started working on memory, but then I started to look a little bit at what's done in perception. And there are plenty of work in perception in the lab. But when it comes to animals and knowing how much perception they have of their environment, you'd be surprised by how little do we actually know about this. Most of what we know are anecdotes. You know, a grizzly bear that had the GPS collar was moving on a straight line and then there was a carcass and there was a direct change of direction, although the carcass was four kilometers away. Okay, well, that tells us something. A grizzly bear may be able to smell a carcass from four kilometers away, but I mean, it's a, it's a story, really. We are a little clueless, to be honest, on what's their, what's their sensory abilities. For sure, I mean, dogs have an amazing sense of smell. Personally, I, I would say it's at all. It would be, be hard to, to give numbers and, and strong science on this. Yeah, they are so uncooperative about reporting yeah. the jackals. Exactly. I mean, even if you ask them direct questions, they're very coy. Metaphors, riddles. They never give you a direct answer. That's, that's the main issue. Very slippery characters. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, they seem pretty cool to me still. I believe in an article you call jackals the winners of humans modifying the environment. Why did you say that? And what makes them the winners? So I think uh, the first thing to realize is that what we do as people in the environment is just another form of challenge for species that are facing, I mean, countless challenges, uh, you know, in the process of evolution. So in, in the fate of a challenge, you've got some winners and you've got some losers. Species that have lower capacity to adapt to changes, that are environmental specialists, that have low demography, those tend to be losers. And there is no doubt that tiger is a loser. It needs a lot of space. It cannot really live close to people. It needs a lot of praise. It cannot really adapt to a lot of environments. Those whole suites of characters just makes it a loser. Now, when you think about jackals, they can adapt to pretty much anything. They can live close to people pretty well. Where habitat fragmentation in general is seen as constraining the movements of species, which is true for many species, it may create highways for others. Jackals are quite reluctant to go in deep, large, forested areas for many reasons. They don't tend to have a lot of food and they tend to have a lot of wolves in Eastern Europe. Those forests are not really suitable for jackals. Where people cut forests and build roads and create settlements, for jackals, that's a pathway. So they benefit from changes. And we know tons of animals who benefit from people. You know, here in the US, uh, gray squirrels are winners. In Europe, starlings are winners. Sparrows were probably winners at some point, and now it's a little bit of a mixed bag because as urbanization gets too clean and they do not have nest sites, then they might actually be losers again. There are a whole range of species that are favored by our activities, and there is little doubt that jackal is, is among them. And what's the current relationship between jackals and wolves? So there are many ways to look at, you know, the influence of one species on another. One of the first things we can do is look at the historical record. So for what we know, jackals were most likely restrained to very small areas in coastal Greece and coastal Bulgaria a thousand years ago. And after that, we see some increase of the population, especially in, in some Bulgarian areas. But it's only around the 20th century that we see jackals largely increasing in numbers and in area occupied. This increase really was even stronger post 1970s. That is really coherent with the fragmentation and persecution of wolf populations in Eastern Europe. You have to imagine that 2000 years ago in Eastern Europe, everything east of Switzerland and Austria would have continuous dense wolf populations on pretty much any kind of landscape except on the coast where most people were located. And those populations of wolves were, were living in a place that was largely forested. When people started to chop down forest and kill wolves, and there were systematic poisoning campaigns, jackal seems to have benefited from that. And that's a, a pattern in ecology that we call mesopredator release, where a large carnivore extinction or at least persecution leads to the takeover by smaller species of carnivores that were before suppressed. 
that's something we've seen here in America with Kayot and that we've seen on other on, on a whole range of ecosystems, also marine ecosystems. So this is the, the main theory. We can do that by looking at the historical records, for example, of hunted animals. We see completely opposite trends. When wolves went down, jackals went up. So that's the first thing. But that's largely what we call correlative. Many things went up or down in the last hundred years. So making a mere correlation doesn't mean there was a causation. But at least it provides us with a hypothesis. Now we start to see other things happening. We see some natural experiment going on where jackal established somewhere and wolves come back and all of a sudden jackals are gone. That's a lot more of an evidence because that's a, a natural experiment that you are witnessing. There is a clear change that coincides with the return of wolves. And so now that provides us with even more confidence that wolves could be suppressing jackals, at least locally. We've done a study with about, I think we are 35 people now doing this study, looking at what kind of environments jackals occupy in Europe. And we find a strong signal that they avoid areas where wolves are present. We cannot explain this pattern by any other variable, whether human population density or snow cover or altitude or vegetation. We just cannot explain it with any other thing than wolves are there. So how do they figure this out? How do they sense this presence of wolves? The pathway really is something that we're trying to figure out, whether the wolves kill jackals. That we know we have a couple of evidence of jackals being killed by wolves. Whether actually jackals simply move away. So in the case of those jackals that disappeared when wolves return, we don't really know if they just dispersed somewhere else or if they got killed. It could be that part of it is a behavioral avoidance and another part could be direct killing. But unfortunately, our knowledge of uh, jackal movement behavior, meaning, for example, fitting animals with GPS colors and even detailed studies using camera traps, have not yet been put in place. We don't have these kind of fine scale results, which would for sure eliminate this question. And so what are the jackals like? Are they social as animals? I mean, how do they live and interact with other species naturally? So again, uh, uh, that's, that's a common uh, answer I'll give you on, on many of those questions is I wish we would know more. <laughs> when it comes to the social aspect of, of golden jackals, there were lots of studies done in Eastern Africa, but that was at a point where we thought that golden jackals were indeed African species as well. Now that there is doubt being casted on, on whether those are jackals, we don't even know if this applies anymore. But what we uh, start to understand in Europe is that golden jackals live in family groups that's centered on a reproductive pair and they have the offspring of this current year and some of the offspring of last year. Many offsprings of last year have actually already, already dispersed when you look at a given pack of jackal. And in general, I would say they are likely to be present in small groups. Groups of eight or more jackals are rare. But again, we would need, we would need additional studies on that. The interactions with uh, other species, I mean, I'm, I would be primarily interested in, in resolving the wolf-jackal relationship. Another fantastic relationship to understand is the jackal-fox relationship. That's another canid. We start to have a canid world between wolves and jackals and foxes and dogs. That's a fantastic canid soup we're having in Europe. The interaction with, with fox is of fundamental interest because red fox is the most common mammalian predator in Europe. I think that it cannot be that jackals arriving in such large numbers, given that they share and have such an overlap in their diet, it cannot be that they don't have any influence on foxes. There must be influence. To which degree? That's going to be, you know, the work of the next 10 years, I hope. But the jackals are bigger than the red foxes, right? They are bigger. Mm -hmm. They are bigger, they are dominant. So the foxes are beneath the jackals in the nutritional chain. Yeah, well, you've got you've got this uh, three level: a wolf on top, jackal in the middle, red fox under. That's very similar to the the guild structure in North America: wolf, coyote, red fox. In fact, you've got two of the links that are the same across the continents. It's only jackal and coyote that may be interchangeable. That's another very interesting study that we that we could do is comparing the role of coyotes and of golden jackal. And I would think that in many areas, they perform the same job in the ecosystem. So it could be that it's just all about the differences in fur, markings, and eating patterns. Yeah. Or do they physically differ significantly? They are medium-sized canids. 
they share a lot of things. They live in, in uh, small family groups. They are super adaptable. They are winners of uh, human modification in the landscape. They can live off carrion when carrion are available. When carrion are not available, they are fine hunting, especially for small mammals. What I would think is that golden jackals have a little more of a scavenger touch than coyotes. In Eastern Europe right now, I think about golden jackal feeding ecology as following two main pathways. The big fox pathway, in which they would basically hunt for small mammals, and small mammals would make the bulk of their diet. And that's when the overlap with red fox is maximum. And this is in these type of cases where there must be some negative influence on red fox. And then the second pathway in which I imagine golden jackals as being four-legged vultures, where they use carrions, leftovers from hunting, leftovers from slaughterhouses, garbage dumps, and clean the ecosystem of, of basically rotting meat. So those to me are the two main pathways for jackal uh, feeding ecology. But again, I, I am sure that in a very diverse ecosystem, they are able to switch feeding habits because they have such a high potential for being adaptable. But they should be pretty good hunters as well, right? When it comes to their hunting, so as an ecologist, you have a puzzle and you try to put a piece of the puzzle together. So how do we know what we know about what they eat? Either we find their scats and we analyze what's in that. Or hunters kill jackals and we can analyze the content of their stomach. Those are the two main pathways. There are other methods. Uh, You could use isotope analysis and so on and so forth. Those two things are indirect. You don't know by which mechanism those things end up in the jackal belly. Is it because jackal killed it or is it because they found it dead? What if you find some wild boar hair? It could be a dead wild boar of natural causes. It could be a shot wild boar by hunters that they feel dressed on sight. Or it could be that jackal killed the wild boar. It's going to be really hard to separate them. Now, given the fact that we find a lot of fur, a lot of skin, and a lot of guts of uh, large herbivores and ungulates in general in jackal's diet, that tells me that it's most likely the remnants from hunting. Because otherwise you would feel a lot more muscle tissue. But the muscle tissue, we don't find much. And that's what the hunters take home in the freezer. So I would say it's largely consumption of dead animals. Now, whether jackals are able to kill some mammals, at least, for sure. they We know they can kill young roe deer. We don't know if they can kill adult roe deer. There is not much studies on that. But really knowing what they can kill does not tell us really much of their influence on the species because that's all a question of how many. If they can kill one roe deer and they do that in a year, that's going to have no influence on roe deer populations. So for that, we'll need to move up to the next level. We need to feed jackals with GPS colors with a high resolution of data acquisition, follow their movements, go around where they spend a lot of time and try to find the prey remains we're going to need to ramp up our studies of jackals if we want to answer these questions in a, you know, in a quantitative manner that can be useful for stakeholders. What I'm hearing, it really makes me realize what a fascinating animal it is. And also it makes me wonder, if it is such a good scavenger, why was it that the wolf and not the jackal got domesticated? They are able to hunt. They seem to be even more flexible than wolves. So why wasn't this animal more convenient for people to start a closer relationship with? That's a, that's a great question. I would love to know why. <laughs> what I would say is whether they are more adaptable to wolves, I think that's up for debate though. Because talking about adaptable species, wolf is a pretty good one. Living from the desert of Saudi Arabia to the North Pole, that's pretty wide. You know, at the time of domestication, there is huge debate nowadays on when that happened. You know, if you just look a couple of years, you know, maybe 10 years ago, most people would tell you 20, 30,000 years in the Middle East. Now some people are advancing 300,000 years. A different worlds 30,000 years ago or 300,000 years ago. So if that's all, it could be that wolves were actually much more present in the ecosystem and came into our contacts much more than jackals were. So I would say, you know, we would have to dig into where jackals were at that time and where wolves were at that time, because you can domesticate only what's in your surrounding. You know, that's a lot of questions for people that are digging in our past and on the ecology of those animals, you know, in the previous millennia to answer. But I think it's an interesting lead. If you still have a minute for us, I would really love to hear about the memory research that you mentioned previously. Mm-hmm. 
What conclusions could be drawn from the research and how do you even approach such a question? So when it comes to understanding memory, there's been a lot of work uh, done in the lab. We all know, we all have seen the typical experiments with rats going in a maze. And we've done those kind of experiments with a lot of species, you know, pigs and cattle and obviously dogs and primates. Doing that in the wild is a completely different world because you don't have direct access to an experimental setup because it's difficult to uh, monitor what's going on in the brain in nature. You don't do that. And we are basically hitting two major questions. When we fit a tag, a GPS collar to an animal, we have trouble understanding whether the patterns that we are seeing in the movements reflect their memory or reflect their perception. So if you see a, a chimpanzee going from fruit tree to fruit tree to fruit tree, what does it tell you? Does it tell you that he knows all the fruit trees? Or does it tell you that he can sense that fruits are ready and is going there? That's really hard. The second problem we have is when we fit a, a GPS collar, we don't know what's animal's knowledge prior to the collar fitting. And, and so we would never know if what we are seeing right now is new to them or if they have done it maybe four years ago. But you didn't have a GPS collar, so you don't know about it. And so to really address those two challenges, I basically designed experimental setups. In the first experiment, I manipulated resource accessibility in the landscape and observed how roe deer, in my case, changed their uh, movements and space use in response to the changes in resources. And I could tell when they would learn about the changes that I made in the landscape so that I would know when that happened. And because I knew when that happened, I could directly link to a response. And the second type of experiment is using reintroductions. So nowadays, when species become locally extinct, they may be programs to reintroduce it in its uh, native environment. And when animals are released, they have no experience about the landscape. So we know that they know nothing about it. We know that they have to learn about it. And this makes it tractable. You will know exactly what's the animal's knowledge about the landscape because you know how to initialize your problem. Your problem is when you open the box, the animal is new to the landscape. It has zero information. And so by using those two types of experimental setups, we are able to quantify how much road deer rely on memory. And what we found is that they mostly use spatial memory and not perception to uh, guide their foraging decisions. So this is how they adapt to resources. They remember where resources are. They remember what are their profitability and they adjust. That has a lot of consequences for conservation because, you know, we, we constantly talk about how we could mitigate impact. And one of the measures that is in vogue at the moment is we do something harmful somewhere and we're going to compensate somewhere else. The problem is, where you do something harmful, of course you've changed the environment, but you have also eradicated knowledge. This particular environment was associated with particular individuals that had specific knowledge about this place. That you don't recover by bringing new animals in later or saving a forest somewhere else. That's something that, uh, that ecology is moving towards, trying to understand that those are individuals. Not all deer are the same. Not all animals are the same. They have individual variations. They have personalities. That's a very hot topic in ecology at the moment, understanding the role of personality. And they have information. And that information is something private. It's their own. And it's something that could be incredibly valuable. There is a study that was shown to um, that migration is, is, is probably a learned process. And losing migrating animals, you actually may lose the migration altogether. Of course, you know, over millennia, animals may evolve again this ability to migrate on that particular landscape. But that would need perhaps, you know, maybe hundreds of years. Yeah, that is something completely incomprehensible to me, the migration. If there is research saying that it is learned, then there must have been a, some sort of primary source, no? So, you know, it could, it, could be, it could be evolving. It's one thing that, you know, it was evolved probably, you know, some animals making mistakes. You know, they've shown in this paper that after several decades, some animals may be able to migrate again. But if you lose all your migrating animals on a given piece of landscape and you reintroduce new animals, you won't have a migration you know, spontaneously arising by magic. It would need it to be learned again. Could it be learned again? That's a question. Maybe yes, maybe not. This is of concern for conservationists because traditionally we've been interested in quantitative metrics such as how many animals, what's the area, quantitative things that we can, that are very tangible. Information 
is something that is much harder to, to comprehend. So maybe we need to find also a way to reconcile that in our conservation of species, try to understand that local adaptations are crucial. So yeah, that, that's been the, the focus of my work for the last yeah, six years or so. It seems relative to some other species, not much is really known about jackals. I mean, they haven't been tagged and tracked so much. There's so much mystery around them. Is that a source of frustration for you, or is that one of the things that keeps you interested in the topic? Uh, both. Uh, absolutely both. If you're fascinated by carnivores and you are European, studying jackals feels like you're Marco Polo. Because every time you look at something, it's new. Every time you look at something, you're learning for the first time what this, what, what is happening. People working on wolves cannot say the same because there has been decades of work on wolves and so they are pushing the boundaries always further. For us, simple things are, are incredibly rewarding. So from a scientist's perspective, it's, um, it's, it's, it's fantastic. From the naturalist and, and conservationist that I am, it's frustrating at times because we would like to answer the questions of the stakeholders. We would like to answer the questions of the general public. And the most common answer that we give, if we are truly honest, is we don't know. That's our main answer to most of the questions. And then we move to the second bit, which is our educated guess. But I would just love that we could move beyond our educated guess by proper data. And fortunately, it's changing, but it's rather slow. Too slow for, for my taste, for sure. So how should the general public interact with jackals? Should we just leave them in peace? Should we put an effort into controlling the population? Yeah, it's <laughs> it's a very complex question, of course. But It's a very complex question. Well, I think an ecologist would tell you that carnivores never overpopulate, really. They might overpopulate people's mind, <laughs> but they might not overpopulate in nature. Carnivores, carnivores are regulated by their, their food source. So... If there is less rodents, there are less jackals. Mm. If there is less garbage availability and less carcasses around, there will be less jackals. In the same way as wolves regulate themselves. Carnivores don't need regulation. In fact, I would say very few species need regulations, if you ask my opinion. That's what I would call a, a traditional anthropocentrist uh, view of nature, that everything needs control and regulation. But Straight out of the Bible, baby. Well, you're right. I mean, I didn't want to say it that way, but yes. That's okay. I'll take the heat. It's, it's, uh, we have Christian cultures, and in Christian cultures, it's very clear that we are supposed to be the steward of the environment. When it comes to jackals, there has been a surge in traditional stakeholders, farmers and, and hunters primarily, a surge of concern because pretty much from the one day to the next, they've seen you know hundreds of those animals they've never seen before. And they share one bad characteristic is they have sharp teeth. And everything that has sharp teeth doesn't start on the right foot. And so they have been persecuted, really, throughout Southeastern Europe. The question is, I mean, we don't really know why they are persecuted. Because we don't know what, what they could be doing that is harmful. It's only perceived at this point. It's perceived that they could reduce hunting opportunities. It's perceived that they could kill livestock. But their real impact in the landscape is probably ne negligible. But, you know, you could extend that to red fox. I mean, how many red fox are killed in Europe? And for what? Oh, I don't really know about that. Does that happen often? I mean, hundreds of thousands of red fox are being killed every year. You, you could look at the numbers for Germany or France, but I would say there's probably 200,000 killed in each country each year or, or numbers like that. Maybe you shouldn't quote those numbers. Uh, check them. But they are huge. They are massive numbers. Really? Is it just for the fur or what? Hunters will justify it, whatever, you know, they would say a lot of things to justify this. Foxes kill chicken. If you can find a lot of people that can complain that they get, get chicken killed by fox, and if it's a major issue, I don't think it's, it's an issue nowadays in this world. They would think that red fox decrease hunting opportunities by eating hair. There are almost no studies showing that. Most commonly, they would, they would say that they're hunting, they're hunting them to control their population. But we know from studies that they, they fail. You cannot control red fox population. Red fox are so adaptable. They compensate hunting by increasing reproduction, increasing dispersal. So there is no possible pathway for hunting to reduce red fox number. So what it is, I mean, we need to have a conversation as a society, but that's, that's really target practice, if you ask my opinion. That's, and red fox are in the landscape and they get shot. But there is 
that is no ecological rational behind supporting red fox hunting, and they would be none supporting golden jackal hunting. Well, for me, there's always very little argument why it makes sense to hunt. You know, once you have protection measures and you do whatever needs to be done to protect your livelihoods, shooting things that try to overcome or are successful at overcoming what you've done is, in my opinion, defensible. When if you protect your livestock very well and, and you've done everything you can and you still have wolves that really very determined in getting after your sheep and you've done everything right, I don't have a problem with shooting wolves. Now, putting sheep in the landscape without any protection and shooting wolves that come close to it, that seems unreasonable to me. So we need a conversation as a, as a society on what we think is legitimate and what is not. Right now, thousands of jackals are killed, but it has no benefit whatsoever. I wanted to ask whether you've had any contact with people observing wildlife kind of resurging and creeping into populated areas because of the lockdown. I'm keeping a mental folder of what's the craziest thing I've seen in the last weeks. For sure, what's to me the top video I've seen are stripped hyena going in town in Israel. Because those are rare animals. They are largely nocturnal. They are, they are known as shy. And they show up in the middle of the day of the city. That was top. But also, it's clear. But we're going to have to analyze it as a scientific community. The animals responded in some ways, changing their activity patterns. There's been a great study looking at grizzly bear activity patterns across gradient of human influence. Close to people, bears are nocturnal. Far from people, they are diurnal. Think about that. How many, how many large mammal is mostly diurnal in Europe? None. <laughs> None. Road deer come at night. They all come at dawn and dusk or at night. You go out in a place where there are no people. Most of those animals are diurnal. There are, there are very few mammals that we think are nocturnal that are really nocturnal by their strictest biology. Most of them are diurnal. I cannot imagine my own species being so affected by another species, like so affected that my entire sleep pattern would change. So that, that puts a little bit of perspective on how much we are messing up with their way of living. And so there is no doubt that some species locally make changes. Like we've seen it even in our study area, that animals react differently. The few people that were lucky enough to go out because they had some work to do, they have seen an amazing amount of wildlife that never happened before. That's true. The other part is nowadays with the buzz, everything is because of COVID. And that's not true. Tons of animals live by our side and we're simply not able to see them. I'll give you an example. Martin, stone martin, it's a common species in Europe. There are hundreds of them in pairs. Well, I, I don't think I've ever seen one. Not that I would be able to recognize it, most likely. They live in pairs. Badgers live in pairs. Red fox live in pairs. White boar live in Berlin. And so on and so forth. People just don't see it. That's what I would call some kind of nature illiteracy. People would see a jackal, they, they call that a dog and whatnot. We don't realize that nature is everywhere. It's all around us. And nowadays, maybe people also pay a bit more attention because they are such in need of nature that when they see animals, they're excited. They take a video, the journalist put it up there. Oh, with coronavirus, foxes are in town. Foxes never left town. Foxes have been in town for 20 years. Oh yeah, actually I do see them here in Germany on my way back from work even. Yeah. There is one particular place where there are many rabbit burrows and sometimes you can see the fox just strolling around there. Absolutely. When we were studying wolves in Italy, I, I remember one of my most interesting field experience. We, were, we had GPS collars on wolves and we would go where they spent a lot of time because we wanted to know what they were eating. Half of your time you end up in a place they were sleeping. That's why they were spending a lot of time. And the other half of the time, we end up on a place they had killed something. And then we would look at what did they kill? A deer, a white boar, whatever. And one day, we had a cluster in a outside port of a restaurant. Was like, oh, that must be something weird with the color. But we went there to check. We found in the snow the beds of 12 wolves that were about 40 meters from a restaurant. <laughs> oh my God, that is just unimaginable. Yeah, but why not? Like, why not? It's, it's in the night. It's a place that has a lot of deer because deer come closer to the valleys where people are. And those wolves are using these places. What I'm saying is that we are messing up with their lives. That does not always prevent them from living really close to us. You've probably seen the, the videos of leopards in, uh, in India. They are, they are in Mumbai. They, they eat dogs and, and pigs and boar in, in Mumbai. So they found a way to live with us. It seems like we humans imagine that we're the superior species, yeah. but actually we're an annoyance that the animals try to avoid. 
And the most common thing you will you will see in the newspapers in Italy, in France, or in Germany, when people see a wolf, they post it on the media and they're like, look at this, they are coming close to us. I mean, wolves have to cross roads. They have to come close to villages. We are everywhere. It's not like there is another option. It's, there is no second way. They have to live with us in the landscape. If you try to walk from your house for 400 meters and you don't cross a road, well, good for you, but it's not going to be the majority of us people. So that that's I find it astonishing that people really don't don't really understand what what animals are and 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 that they live close to to us. This makes me think about the phrase you know going to nature. Mm. Well, we are here. Yeah, it is all around us. Where else should we go? Yeah, we should just be you know a little bit more observant and appreciative. Absolutely. So one last question about jackals. I have no idea why they howl. What are they trying to say? Well, the main hypothesis of what they're saying is, neighbor, this is my place, don't come into it. So it's mostly territorial defense, right? So howling, in general, when we do howling surveys and we get one group to answer, we're going to get the neighbors and the neighbors hmm. and the neighbors. You basically trigger a chain of reaction where every group is kind of marking their presence, their numbers, and their land. So it's most we think it's mostly territorial. Given the size of their home range, it's quite unlikely that they need vocalizations to find each other in the same group because it's quite a small place they live in. So territorial defense is probably the most uh, likely uh, mechanism. And if you, I don't know if you heard it personally, but it's very cool. It's a very nice sound. I, I would, I would welcome that sound across Europe at night. It's beautiful. And where should we go look for it? Or to hear it? I would say the Danube Delta is uh, one great place. And in general, I would say southern uh, Croatia, the Dalmatia region of Croatia. Those are two fantastic places to go that are also wonderful for nature in general, not only for jackals. Hearing jackals at night when, you, when you're having a you know, dinner, it's, it's a fantastic experience. And scary. <laughs> I wouldn't say scary. I think it's... <laughs> I mean, think about them as a small as a small dog out there. It's it's cool. I did not expect that. This makes me think that it's about time to bring in one of the main characters in the dog's history. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> and we definitely have the right person for that. Oh, I, it's not me, I guess. Unfortunately, you're you're getting pretty close, but. <laughs> Are we teasing the next episode? Is that what we're doing? Exactly. Well, we'd like to thank Anurag Chaudhary. And Nathan Rank. So we'll see you next time. Indeed. Ciao.